want to tell you the story of, I think, the most uh, incredible book I have in my library. I've been collecting books from second-hand book dealers for the last uh, 60 years. And uh, this is, I think, the most uh, incredible book I have ever found. Uh, it's, it's a manuscript. And uh, it's incredible on many levels. Uh, the book itself, the manuscript itself, is incredible. Uh, the author is incredible. And the story behind the book and the author are also incredible. I, and by incredible, I mean incredible. Uh, stick with me. It all started at 25 years ago in the summer of 1994 in Chicago. I, at the time, was traveling around a lot. I was the organizer of an Italian gas station and car wash show. And I was in Chicago to meet the organizers of the International Car Wash Association. <laughs> Who would believe there is such a thing? And uh, in my travels, I always tried to uh, squeeze in a, a, a trip to a second-hand bookshop. And uh, so w when I got to Chicago, uh, I uh, quickly looked through the yellow pages in my hotel room. In those days, it was before internet, really, and before Amazon. Uh, in fact, uh, that same summer, uh, was the summer that Jeff Bezos, 30-year-old Jeff Bezos, in his garage, uh, founded Amazon. So that was uh, a way away. So uh, I looked up uh, the Yellow Pages and found uh, the adverts and found one, Ogada and Wilson, Booksellers Limited, Chicago's oldest bookstore. Established 1882, used books, bought and sold. Well, I thought that's exactly what I want. So, uh, as it was near the University of Chicago, I took public transport, not to spend too much money on a taxi. And when I got there, uh, I started browsing through the shelves. And I had to admit it was a little disappointing. The uh, books were mainly university textbooks. Uh, and so what with one thing and another, I started talking to the uh, owners, I suppose. I don't know if it was an O'Gara or a Wilson. I mean, maybe neither. The bookstore was uh, over 100 years old. Uh, and in the course of the chat, it came out that I was uh, living in Italy. And so uh, a man said, maybe I have a book that could interest you. And he pulled out this enormous tome, this enormous tome, this volume <laughs> weighs a ton. I think it's over three kilos and is big. Uh, and so I opened it up and discovered that it was nothing less than a manuscript, uh, a typescript uh, in Italian. And it looked like it was over 500 pages. And I saw it was by Adriacus, the Admiral Augusto Capone. It was entitled Pro Patria, Autobiographical Notes Dedicated to My Children. And then I, I started reading chapter one, as one does. Uh, chapter one, My Family and My Infancy, 1872 to 1886. I was born in Venice on the 3rd of November, 1872, the last of 11 brothers and sisters. And already that's amazing to have a person say he was born in 
1872. I, I love this time travel aspect of things. My father, born in 1821, belonged to a distinguished Jewish family, famous and respected in the city, traditionally very Italian and highly patriotic. In fact, my father uh, took part in the defense of Venice in the 1848-49 revolution as a soldier in the National Guard. And I saw that there were some interesting things uh, about uh, the campaign in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, on the Etna in the Aegean and in Crete, uh, the campaign in the Far East on the Vespucci, 1897 to 1899. The First World War, 1914, 1918. My participation in the uh, Italo-Turkish War of 1911-1912. That's when uh, Italy uh, conquered Libya and created a colony there. I mean, it looked interesting, looked interesting, very interesting. But the, the volume was so big and so heavy. And in those days, uh, in those days, uh, I didn't have wheels on my suitcase. And to take a book this size and this weight, I thought, no, I, I, can't, I can't do it. I asked him, how, how much is it? And he said, it's $40. That's not even too much. But I said, okay, no, I, I'm afraid I... No, it's, it's too big for me. I won't take it. So I didn't take it. And I went back to my hotel. I had uh, supper by myself. And I kept thinking about this uh, manuscript written by an Italian admiral born in 1872. And I thought, it has to be at least interesting. I mean, at least it's interesting. Uh, and it could be a lot more. And uh, it kept working in my mind. And, uh, when I went to bed, I was thinking about it. And I thought, how can I leave this, leave this book uh, there uh, in that shop? Uh, I, ha I have to buy it. It's a, I'm, I don't have a manuscript in my library. This, this is something really special. So the next morning before my meetings, I this time took a taxi which cost me $50 and rushed back to the bookstore, had the taxi wait for me. I bought the book. Uh, the receipt says that it cost $40 with tax $3.50 for a total of $43.50. Uh, signed on June the 14th, 1994. So uh, I... Uh, I bought the book and uh, brought it back to Italy. And then uh, at that time there wasn't internet. Uh, he didn't figure in my encyclopedia. In those days we even consulted encyclopedias. And so uh, that was that. And I started reading the book. I started reading the book. So at this point, I can imagine you saying, uh, this is all very interesting, but it's not incredible. Uh, please get to the incredible part. And so, as I said, there are, it's three times incredible. Well, I'll get to the first incredible part. The, uh, for the actual contents of the manuscript, I'll perhaps leave that to a, a second video. The incredible part of this book is the fact that this author, this uh, young naval officer, who becomes an admiral, who fights so many campaigns around the world, who ends up in 1917 becoming the head of the Navy intelligence, the secret service of, of the Navy. And how he, in the aftermath of the First World War, in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, sees the seeds of communism being planted in Italy. 
and he sees unrest being fomented among the working class in Italy. There are strikes, there are demonstrations, and things are getting out of hand. And so when Benito Mussolini and his fascist party march on Rome in October 1922, contesting the established government of Italy, and instead of there being a civil war, the king, Vittorio Emanuele III, appoints Mussolini as the prime minister directly. He uh, steps over the existing prime minister and appoints Mussolini, thereby embracing Mussolini, law and order and the fascist party. And along with the king, also Augusto Capon embraces the fascist party, law and order and Benito Mussolini. And he is faithful to both the fascist party and Mussolini until his death 21 years later. And I have to say, after reading the 580 pages of this man's memoirs, that I came to like him. I came to admire him. But I realized I had to separate the man from the ideology that he embraced. That life is more complicated than history. History tends to simplify. But here is basically a good man who had principles. He had been in the armed forces for 50 years. He was a man of rectitude. He was a patriot. And he was loyal until his death. The word Jewish fascist is almost an oxymoron. And that's the first thing that makes this book an incredible read. It teaches us to be humble, that life is more complicated than we'd like to think. The speed bump in this love affair between Augusto Capon and Mussolini is, of course, the promulgation of the racial laws in 1938. But even then, uh, Capon doesn't believe that this is really in Mussolini's heart. He said that Mussolini knows better than anyone that uh, the march on Rome was partly financed by the Jews. He knows, he said, that, that Mussolini had a Jewish mistress for many years, that uh, Mussolini has always uh, praised the patriotism of the Jews and that this can't really be the real Mussolini speaking. He recognizes he must be under some pressure from Hitler and the Nazis. He decries the racial laws. The Jews are no longer able to own radios. They are taken out of the phone books. He is dismissed permanently from the armed forces. But in all of this, he still is loyal to the king, to Mussolini, and to the fascist party. So Capon finishes writing his memoirs in Rome in 1943 during the Second World War. And he writes, My dear children, there, finally, I have arrived at the end of my memoirs and I am happy that this has been allowed me in spite of my advanced age and my serious illness. He was in this time uh, 70 uh, 
years old. The book doesn't end there. It continues with an appendix of some 40 pages, which is a, a diary. He writes, I was in the middle of chapter 26 when the coup d'etat of the 25th of July 1943 took place. And so he decides to write his impressions of what's happening uh, day by day. And he is absolutely uh, destroyed when they depose Mussolini and they send him up to a, in prison on a hotel in the middle of the mountains of central Italy. And he is even more disgusted when General Badoglio takes over uh, the reins of a so-called government and uh, concludes an armistice with the people that they've been fighting, with, with the Americans and the, the British and the... He calls a, a Badoglio, Badolienko. Gave him a sort of a Russian communist sounding name, which personifies everything that he's against. And he is then even more horrified when uh, a Badoglio declares war against Germany on the axis, on Germany and Japan. Capon is utterly devastated. This goes against all his 70 years of a life of principle, of uh, his, his life of rectitude, of moral rectitude. He considers this moral turpitude to go and declare war on the person you are fighting beside until the other day. And you come to the end of the diary. Uh, it is really, really an, am an amazing uh, moment. It's on the 16th of October and he writes, there are incredible things happening in Rome this morning. Groups of fascists, they say, together with some German military, have rounded up Jews of every age and sex, and they have taken them nobody knows where. The fact is certain, but the details aren't. They continue the requisitions of everything they can get hold of, more or less legalized by the high Germanic authorities. All the shops, or almost all, have been emptied in this way. Even some pharmacies, it's a real sacking. In spite of this, due to the betrayal of Badoglio and of the ferocious instinct of the Huns, I continue to be of the opinion that all true Italians should unite around the Duce to wash the shame without peer that has been inflicted upon us by a bunch of weak-kneed traitors. But unfortunately, the majority, at least of the middle class, don't feel the shame of the surrender and are awaiting the liberators. And this quite naturally for the, their impatience with the sacrifices and the dangers of the present era. Should I perhaps say with Carducci, is our homeland so ignoble? And that is the end of the diary. It finishes like that. And this was a mystery to me. It just finishes with Capon's last words hanging in the air. 
this last entry of Capon's diary is haunting. It's also ominous. We know that he has bad health, but that last entry doesn't sound like he is on the verge of giving up his diary. This first incredible part is the fact that there's this Jewish man who embraced fascism and Mussolini. And at that time, I wasn't able to find anything out about who this Augusto Capon was. There wasn't Google. But after the advent of Google, in the first few years, I would occasionally, when I thought of it, type in Augusto Capon, and there would be nothing. But then, one day, there suddenly was. Perhaps it was Wikipedia or something. And I discovered something dramatic. Dramatic. That on the 16th of October, 1943, that Augusto Capon was also rounded up by the Germans and the fascists, and that he was sent to a holding area and then shipped off to Auschwitz. And he was apparently killed in the gas chambers almost upon arrival. This makes me shiver when I say this, even now. And as time went on, I discovered even more things about Augusto Capon and broke through into a yet another layer of incredibility. I discovered that he was none other than the father-in-law of Enrico Fermi, the Italian physicist who created the first nuclear reactor and is called the architect of the atomic bomb. His, uh, Capon's daughter, Laura, married Fermi, who was a Catholic, in the early 20s. And when Enrico Fermi won the Nobel Prize in 1938, he took his whole family to Sweden to get the prize and they escaped, they fled to America and never came back to Italy. And this led me to do some research into the Fermis and I found out that Laura Fermi had actually written some books, uh, and not the least, one called Atoms in the Family, My Life with Enrico Fermi. And I bought the book, this time through Amazon, and I was a bit surprised that uh, she doesn't really mention her father much at all. At one point she mentions that he was uh, an official in the Navy. I mean, he was an admiral. He had been the head of the Secret Service. And then there was a special moment when she is talking about her wedding and includes a photograph of the wedding. And she says, the naval officer is my father. And he looks resplendent in his white uniform. He puts everybody else in the photograph in the shade. I mean, I, I recognize the author of the memoirs. But in this book, 
she mentions only in passing that she was of a Jewish family. She doesn't mention uh, escaping from the racial anti-Semitic laws. She doesn't mention that her father was a fascist, was a Mussoliniano, and that he died in a concentration camp. She doesn't mention that. Isn't that a strange thing not to mention? And not only that, I discovered she had written yet another book, a book on Mussolini. I had to buy it, saying, wow, this, uh, if she gives a, a personal take on Mussolini, she will have a lot to write about. This could be a fascinating book. And instead it's not. At least I, I haven't read it. I've uh, thumbed through it for personal recollections. And there are none. She starts off at one point. The urge to write this book grew in me out of the bewilderment I experienced several years ago when in the course of checking dates and events for another book, I began to discover the true Mussolini. I thought I knew what he had been like, for I had lived in Rome until 1938, when I came to the United States with my family, and Mussolini had been in power 16 years, etc., etc. When I came to the United States with my family, she doesn't mention that she fled fascism with her family. And there is nothing personal in this book, except at the very end, there is a very strange, a very strange ending to this book. She's talking about the aftermath of World War II, or the aftermath of fascism and uh, Italy to be rebuilt. She says, today Mussolini is the skeleton in the cupboard, a shameful incident in the history of a people. And I thought to myself, Laura, when you wrote that, you knew you were writing also about your own family. Today, Mussolini is the skeleton in the cupboard, a shameful incident in the history of a people. And this uh, led me to reflect on why I found this manuscript in this secondhand bookshop in Chicago. And of course, Fermi and his family lived in Chicago. That is where they worked on uh, the atomic bomb. And I could imagine, I don't know this for true, I am just speculating, that Laura Fermi was so much in a hurry to uh, sweep her Italian heritage behind her to lock the door of the of the closet where the skeleton was that she very probably didn't teach the children Italian I don't know I don't know but she, I could imagine her not teaching the children Italian saying forget Italy and then I can imagine that in 1994 Laura had already died, that her children or her grandchildren were cleaning out an apartment in Chicago, found this manuscript, saw it was an Italian and said, what are we going to do with this? And one of them said, I know, let's take it to O'Gara and Wilson. 
And that's where our stories intersect.